Warning, this video will include discussion slash depictions of transphobic and generally xenophobic opinions about queer people. I would advise staying out of the comments section, and if you choose to venture down there, please do so with caution. Safeguard your own mental health. Thank you, and enjoy the video. Grand Theft Auto has been around a long time. I've said it before, but I'll say it again here. Because of the franchise's longevity and cultural dominance for so long now, I think that looking at the GTA series at any given point in its history is one of the most effective ways to take the temperature of a very large subset of people in both America and, more broadly, the world. GTA is one way to get a broad overview of how a lot of people, predominantly straight cisgendered men, view certain aspects of American culture as a whole. It's a particularly broad view of the American zeitgeist at any given time, you might say. So it's Pride Month, happy Pride y'all, and while I did a very broad breakdown of all queer representation that I could find in the whole GTA series a little while ago, which you should definitely go and watch, link in the description, today I wanted to take a more hyper-focused look at the area of queer identity that I personally have experience with as a trans woman, and see just how Grand Theft Auto has portrayed trans people in the past both kinda good and ugh, not good at all. And also look to the future of what we might be able to expect in GTA 6, given the fact that our culture remains hyper-focused and interested in the trans experience though so rarely for good reasons. So if you yourself are queer or trans, please proceed with caution, as, well, it's Grand Theft Auto. You have been warned. So the first possible trans representation that we can find in the series is one that may not actually fall under that umbrella depending on who and how you define your terms. I think it's a fairly safe assumption that throughout Rockstar's history, they have either had very few, or more likely, no explicitly trans people working at the company, or that any and all trans employees at Rockstar were too terrified of losing their jobs, or even sunk so far into the closet because of internalized transphobia to speak out. So I therefore think it's also a fair assumption to claim that the depiction we're about to look at was probably written by a cisgendered man with little to no thought as to the implications of the character they were creating, or what it said about the marginalized identity that it targets. So what am I talking about? Well, in 2002's Grand Theft Auto Vice City, there was an 80s glam rock band called Love Fist. Now, if you want to hear more about this, like I said earlier, go watch my full breakdown of queer people in the series, but skipping over the details here, Love Fist were a fictional band that the player, Tommy Versetti, did a few jobs for through their manager, Kent Paul, and one of their main mission threads involved a stalker who had a particular hatred for the Scottish rockers, and this is unfortunately how they were depicted. I'll see Lovefist burn! Lovefist ruined my life! Now, again, this isn't necessarily a trans woman. They could be a cisgendered crossdresser, or a variety of other gender identities, but let's be honest, this was 2002, and again, I am quite confident in stating that the writers didn't consider any of this. So it seems fairly reasonable to assume that this depiction was in fact meant to be a trans woman in the 1980s, which was a time in American history when trans visibility was starting to truly enter the public consciousness, thanks to real-world rock and rollers and pop stars who challenged typical gender norms like David Bowie or the Twisted Sisters, to name just a couple. This depiction seems almost explicitly aimed at tapping into that part of the 1980s culture, since glam rockers were such a huge part of the decade's global appeal, and the glam scene itself had an intense amount of gender ambiguity going on, to say the least. 
Rock and Rollers had pretty much always gotten some amount of this, going back to the very roots of the genre in Rhythm and Blues and its original audience, consisting almost exclusively of people of color. This backlash against anything that challenged gender norms was and is rooted in an ignorance and xenophobia towards people of color, but also just about anybody who challenged the societal norms of the times. And this only became more explicit as the decades rolled by, culminating in the 1980s is obsession with people assigned male at birth, having long wavy hair, wearing makeup, and strutting their stuff on stage in high heels, and other apparel that had otherwise been exclusively thought of as female for most of the 19th and 20th centuries. In Vice City, this person who I am going to refer to as a woman, given all the background I've just laid out, and the likely intentions behind it, was a woman who had an issue with the band Love Fist in general, and claims on multiple occasions that they ruined her life. She is never given the opportunity to go into detail about what exactly she meant by this, but one interpretation, given the likely writers behind the character, is that she found some comfort or acceptance in Love Fist's own gender ambiguity when on stage, and perhaps started their physical transition as a result, only to later have regrets because of the way that society treated her, and subsequently deciding to take it out on the band themselves. She interrupts a supposed public meetup that the band was going to have with the intention of killing them, but, well, for one, her plan is incredibly flawed and poorly executed, <laughs> pun intended, when she starts shooting before even seeing the band step out of the car. But also, too, the band weren't even in the car since they asked the player, Tommy, to drive to the meet without them in their fully window-tinted Love Fist limousine to draw out their attacker and then kill her himself, which, at least as far as the player in the moment is concerned, they do, blowing up the assassin's vehicle and completing the mission called Psycho Killer. However, and while I don't think this was the intention behind this decision, I still think of this as my headcanon, she survives the player's initial attack, despite literally being inside a car that explodes, so I'm just going to add this to our list of superpowers. And then she returns in audio form only during another mission that parodies the movie Speed, where the player has to drive the band's limo, the very same one, above a certain speed, or the vehicle along with the player and all members of Love Fist will explode and grant her her revenge. This also means, though, that this character canonically survives since the player is never given another opportunity to kill her, so I'm taking that as a minor, if unintended, victory, because if she had been killed in that first encounter, it would have made this depiction even worse for me. Staying in the glam-filled 1980s, we next come to the most interesting and the first explicit depiction of a trans person in the series with Rennie Wasselmeyer. Side note, I would just like to quickly credit whoever wrote her article at the GTA Wiki for actually taking the time to use the correct pronouns based on her gender identity at any given time. That honestly kind of made my day when writing this script. Whoever you are, hats off to you. So who is Rennie? Well, Rennie was a person assigned female at birth in Germany, born sometime probably in the 1950s, though her actual age is never given, so I may in fact be committing a mortal sin here. Now, Rennie was very clearly written by somebody who is cisgendered and was voiced by a cis woman, Barbara Rosenblatt. But in her only physical appearance, in the originally PSP exclusive title, GTA Vice City Stories, he is initially identifying as a man while living as a film director operating out of Prawn Island circa 1984 when the player character Vic Vance first meets him. Now, I say that Rennie was very clearly written by a cisgendered person because his depiction as the first explicitly transgendered person in the series is based in a lot of rather dated and negative stereotypes. However, I find it necessary to clarify 
that I myself actually happen to love Rennie as a character, and whenever they are on screen, I just enjoy their performance so much. As the writer of their GTA wiki page states, Rennie was likely made into not just a trans stereotype, but also a German stereotype because of Germany's actual history with sex reassignment surgery, which goes back to as early as the 1930s, before a certain faction of truly horrible human beings literally burned much of the literature on the subject in their infamous book burnings. Just keep that in mind in case you're anti-trans. Know who your allies are here. Just, just saying. In fact, Germany has often been stereotyped as being particularly laissez-faire about gender roles, at least in comparison to many other parts of the quote-unquote Western world, and Rennie's heavy accent is itself a way to invoke this thinking in the average player's mind, given the cultural baggage it already often had from films dating back many decades at the time of Vice City Stories' release. Now, Rennie being written as multiple stereotypes might incline some people to find their depiction a bit unsettling, and I wouldn't necessarily blame you. But, like I said earlier, I actually love them, but not because of what they were meant to represent in the story, that being a crazy eccentric person who just can't decide how they'd like to present, but more so for the same reasons that I, as a trans woman, love, say, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Rocky Horror was not written by or for trans and queer audiences, but it was subsequently reclaimed by us, just like the word queer itself was, and has therefore become a part of our own cultural canon, you might say. I think of Rennie positively in the same vein that I think of Tim Curry's depiction of Frankenfurter, who isn't explicitly a trans person, more directly, if certain assumptions are made, a cisgendered crossdresser, but there is definitely a considerable amount of overlap with the trans experience as presented in the album, film, and play. Not to mention the fact that people who presented in a similar manner to Frank most certainly did and do exist, and some of them certainly do end up eventually coming out as transgender themselves. The biggest indication that Rennie was written as mostly a joke, and almost certainly by somebody with little to no real-life reference, is the fact that she goes through four different sex reassignment surgeries throughout her life. Being initially assigned female at birth, fully transitioning to a man, then back to a woman, and back to a man again by the time the player meets him in 1984. And in fact, Rennie's final mission for the player involves him transitioning a final time back to a woman, which the player assists her in doing by driving her to the hospital, since by that point, she is being pursued and harassed by members of the Mendez cartel, most likely because of the fact that Diego Mendez hates her and himself because the two had been an item while she was identifying as a woman, and this presumably hurt poor Diego's fragile masculinity. Oh, boohoo. Another reason that I tend to enjoy Rennie's depiction, despite the problematic aspects of her character, is the fact that at no point is she treated as a bad or unsympathetic character by the narrative or the other characters around her. Both the player character and his brother Lance become friends with Rennie, enough to casually laugh together and for Vic to even help him out during his escape from Diego Mendez, all at no personal gain to himself. Then there's also the fact that she's friends with, and treated well by, literally Phil Collins, who, yeah, is also canonically in a GTA game, in case you didn't know. Rennie also technically makes another appearance in a GTA game, actually, in the previously exclusive PSP title, GTA Liberty City Stories, where she is the host of the radio station Flashback FM. However, in this depiction, she is much more explicitly adult, if you know what I mean, in her depiction, given that she divulges many details of her life growing up that feed into those initial negative stereotypes, which almost certainly formed the basis for her writing. However, this depiction, while canonically after Vice City Stories, was actually written before it, so the last time we see her in the series 
is the better representation of the two, so that's nice. The next explicit trans representation in the GTA series comes in Grand Theft Auto 4 with another less than flattering depiction that can, however, be taken as positive with a little bit of clever hindsight headcanon, Bluesy St. John. Now, this is a character I never actually paid enough attention to in the past to notice the fact that they were trans. Bluesy is one of the performers seen at the Russian Perestroika Cabaret Club in Hove Beach that the player can see during a hangout with any of the game's friends. Now, basically, the entire joke of Bluesy hinges on the fact that he's a trans man, since when you see him, he is presenting as a quite overtly and overly feminine woman while performing his sing-talky bit, which I believe has two or maybe three separate variations. Bluesy, at a surface glance, looks very obviously female, dressing in a very feminine outfit and speaking in a very feminine, light southern drawl, and everything with his performance seems relatively quote-unquote normal until he reveals the fact that he is, in fact, a trans man, or at least strongly considering sex reassignment surgery at some point in the near future. This is the whole punchline since, obviously, nobody who looks like Bluesy could in fact be a man, that's just ridiculous. And even the cis male cabaret announcer begs him to not get a sex change since he looks so attractive presenting female. It should also be noted that at no point does anyone in the game actually use he him pronouns for him, and in fact, I myself am only assuming that that's appropriate since, well, GTA 4 was 2008, and who knows, by the current day, year of our lord 2024, perhaps he has actually had the appropriate surgeries and is finally living a fully happy life as his true self. But for all I know, they could be non-binary or more comfortable with they-them pronouns. Who knows? I didn't know about Bluesy until my most recent playthrough of GTA 4, which I made a 5-hour analysis video on, which you should definitely go watch if that sounds like your cup of tea. But I was outright disgusted at their use as a simple joke, and not to mention the number of explicitly anti-trans jokes present throughout GTA 4, and 5 for that matter, that are, granted, usually made by the game's depictions of crazy right-wingers on the radio or television, like the GTA 4 version of Howard Stern. But still. Like I said, Grand Theft Auto is one often quite effective way to get a sense of how people thought about these kinds of issues at the time of any individual game's release. This video and all videos on my channel are brought to you in large part by the wonderful support of my YouTube members and by patrons on Patreon.com. An extra special thank you to my executive producer and Walkerville tier supporters, Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Chuck K45, King GTA 15, Die Castinator, and Michael Vandenberg. Supporters at these tiers also have the option to promote a little bit of their own content, so this video is also brought to you by Ezra's YouTube channel, Scott Games 99, Mason Collins podcast channel, We're About Everything, Chuck K45's Upstart Farming channel, and Die Castinator's channel, All About Diecast Cars. I release all videos a little early to all supporters and give you any of the original music tracks created for a given video. You'll also get to see your name in the credits of all videos produced while you are pledged, get access to a small patron-slash-members-only Discord server where you can easily speak with me or see little behind-the-scenes snippets, and you'll receive my eternal gratitude. Seriously, especially these days, those of you who support my work directly are absolutely incredible and I can't properly express how grateful I am to you all. Sign up as a YouTube member today, or get slightly better prices at patreon.com forward slash the criminal historian. Thank you so much for watching. And the last arguably trans representation seen in the series, beyond the occasional joke by passing NPCs or radio hosts, came in 2009 with the release of GTA Chinatown Wars, 
originally for the Nintendo DS and later ported to the PlayStation Portable. Now, if Rennie was about as positive a depiction as we ever got, and Bluesy St. John was the most neutral we ever got, well, the following character is the most negative we ever got. In fact, it ends up beating Vice City for being a bit more clear in what the intention behind the writing was, and using the fact that so many people are inherently disgusted by things they don't understand or are different from them, to make their predominantly cisgendered male audience hate the character in order to more thoroughly enjoy killing them, which is just gross. Who am I talking about? Well, ugh. I thought I would never have to bring her up in a video again, but here I am trying to play the algorithm for Pride Month and, you know, pay my bills. <sighs> Rudy Diavanzo. Now, Rudy, throughout her appearance in Chinatown Wars, is not exactly presented as a trustworthy or sympathetic character. There's a certain sense, right from the get-go, that she isn't to be trusted, and that she's looking out only for herself. But eventually you, the player, learn that she has been lying to you the whole time in order to use your abilities to take out her own Mafia family's enemies around the city. When this is discovered, you go do the GTA thing of confronting a former mission giver in order to presumably kill her, although this isn't necessarily the initial goal, rather it is to simply confront her about her treachery, but I mean, come on, we all knew how this mission was going to end before we got to the reveal. See, when Huang Li, the player character, finally does track Rudy down, he finds them at a private bar having a meeting with one of her cohorts. As it turns out, well, that cohort is likely her boyfriend, and Rudy herself is a trans woman. I should clarify that once again, that isn't necessarily the case. It is entirely possible that Rudy would still use he him pronouns and be fully confident in identifying as a cross-dressing man or a non-binary person or any other number of identities in between. However, once again, assuming the intentions behind the writers, who I have no trouble assuming were probably cisgendered men, assuming she's a trans woman seems like a fair assumption to make. Unlike the trans woman depicted in Vice City though, Rudy neither has superpowers that allow her to survive a car blowing up, nor does she survive the player's confrontation. The reveal that she is trans is used as a means to show that she is two-faced and meant to emphasize her ability to not be trusted. This was also the case for the woman in the original Vice City, like I said, but at least there she gets to somehow miraculously survive, and at least there, the reason why the player is killing her is because she herself is trying to kill Love Fist. Here though, the player is originally seeking out Rudy to confront her about her lies, until the player learns that she's trans, which pushes him over the edge, and is meant to actually make the player take explicit pleasure and satisfaction from killing her. This is easily the most disgusting depiction in the whole series, and it's almost ironic considering the very next year, Rockstar would go on to be a little more accepting of queer people, and clearly seek to, in some form, rehabilitate some of their image as being inherently xenophobic, with the release of GTA 4's second DLC, The Ballad of Gay Tony. But, well, if you want to hear more about my opinions on that, you'll have to sign up on my Patreon, or as a YouTube member, to see the breakdown of that game that I either just released, at the time of this video's airing, or am just about to release, depending on how much I feel like working my butt off this week. So, Grand Theft Auto hasn't exactly had a history of being progressive, as you've seen from this video. But it also hasn't been a non-stop line of completely unambiguous hatred either. It has had moments of light positivity and depictions that can, at the very least, be interpreted charitably in hindsight or otherwise reclaimed like my darling Rennie. However, the last GTA game was in 2013, the last story mode we got anyway, and while there was some minor, less than positive depictions of trans people in that game, for one, they were eventually removed, 
and there wasn't anything else as explicit as Rennie or Bluesy St. John, probably because even by that point, more than 10 years ago, even Rockstar was seeing that the needle was beginning to shift, and that dying on that hill was going to lose them a rather substantial set of people who might otherwise be willing to fork over their hard-earned cash. People like myself, other queer people, and the people who support us, like, maybe, I don't know, yourself, I hope. And these days, there has been a large shift in acceptance, especially among the younger adult generations, whom Rockstar is certainly going to be trying to hold on to, which may in fact result in our first truly positive depiction of a trans person in Grand Theft Auto 6, whenever it finally hits store shelves and breaks the gaming industry once again. I am holding out for it, but I think there's a good chance we'll get it. Maybe a mission giver, or maybe something smaller on the scale of something like Bluesy, but what I would like more than anything is a depiction of a trans person where the fact that they are trans is effectively inconsequential to their portrayal. Just another aspect of them that isn't actually worth commenting on in any substantial manner. I don't necessarily want a condescending portrayal of Rockstar trying to say, See, see, we accept you now, please buy our stuff. I want, say, a bartender who casually mentions that they're trans, or a mission giver who is, that you might not even be able to identify at first glance. I want true, positive representation, which is to say, showing that we, like any other group, just exist. We are just people, and we aren't looking to always be upfront, in your face, in the center of attention, and explicitly used as tokens to prove that Rockstar has changed since the days of Rudy Diavanzo. Don't get me wrong, I would also take that kind of a portrayal, and I think if we do get one, it's maybe more likely that it leans in that direction, but I'm just saying what I myself would want to see if we do end up getting something. And given our increased visibility in the years since GTA V's release, I think that not including at least some trans people somewhere in the game, in a positive or neutral way at least, would be, in and of itself, a message from Rockstar. So for now, I'll wait and see, but I am hopeful that things will only get better from here because I would so very much love to love this series again, wholeheartedly. I am the Criminal Historian, and I hope you've enjoyed this video. I'll see you next week, but like I said, I strongly recommend you check the channel now, or my Patreon, to see if I've already released the Ballad of Gay Tony Game Vault episode, because at the time of writing, all that's left is the editing stage, so if it isn't out yet, I give you full permission to complain about it in the comments below. However, in the interest of safeguarding my own mental health, I very likely won't be reading any comments on this video, so if you really want to share something with me, sign up as a channel member or even sign up on Patreon at the free tier and leave a comment over on this video's public post over there. Until next time, I hope you have yourself a wonderful evening. Bye bye